So now what we're going to talk about is some of the few hardware trends that have started to appear uh, in today's world. Just because when you build an operating system, you always need to think about what kind of hardware you're targeting. Because the operating system is the one that sits between the hardware and user level programs. And make sure that user level programs don't have to worry about some of the nasty aspects of the hardware itself. For example, what if the number of processors increase, right? The user program doesn't want to think about that. And so those are some of the things that you need to be able to deal with. So the first thing, like I said, is just the number of processors, right? You're going from one single core to like three or four, or in Intel's case, even up to 80, right? And you have a program that you've written once, and you want to be able to, able to run it on 80 cores, 48 cores, it doesn't matter. You want the operating system to transparently be able to use as many resources as there are available, right? And for this, um, the operating system takes upon itself the job of figuring out all the, how many cores there are when it boots up, right? And then does things like allocate the appropriate data structures so that your programs don't have to worry. The next thing that the operating system needs to worry about today in general is just power. Right? So, so if you look at your phones, for example, you're having a battery that's only a big and you want it to be able to run with it for the whole day, for example, and you want it to be able to run a powerful application, be able to connect to the internet all the time, people run Skype all the time. Right? In such cases, the operating system has the unenviable task of actually having to manage these different programs, different competing tasks, so that your battery lasts the whole day. Right? And so that is another example of a task that the operating system has to do these days. Then there's also the task of all the different resources that exist on the chip, right? For example, there are controllers for disks and keyboards and mouses and other kinds of I.O. devices. There's also things such as the memory controllers and their own interaction with the GPU in this case, right? And there are all these, then there are things like flash, right? And so all of these different devices are different. They interact differently with the operating system. They interact differently with the program. For example, when you want to display something on the screen, it's very different, fundamentally different than when if you want to write a file, right? And so the operating system in some ways is exposing these abstractions that enable you to interact with these different devices. And so you'll go over how these different devices all work in concert, okay? Uh, finally, I would like to leave you in general with the storage hierarchy in systems in general, because a lot of what the OS does is actually manage these, right? It manages everything from the memory up to the disks, right? Everything below, so this is all managed in software, it's an OS, everything below this is all managed in hardware, okay? So everything from the caches down to the CPU is managed in hardware, everything memory on goes onto the disk is managed by the OS. So in some ways, the OS has to figure out what data that it needs to bring into memory, figure out what programs it needs to keep in memory, which state it needs to keep in memory so that your program performs optimally. For example, what if you, you want to write a simple program that access only a few data structures and all the data structures are in disk? You're going to run significantly slower than uh, if you ran it all in memory. Another example that you would have seen today with Apple is they have introduced this thing called Fusion I.O where you've got flash and disk on the same device, right? And so Apple's OS transparently manages what goes into the flash and what goes into the disk based on what it thinks are the important applications, right? So this is a task that the operating system manages. So in this case, Mountain Lion will be doing that. Right. right. Because of a lot of this, a general trend in OS has been that the number of lines of code is just increasing, right? So you go from the NASA Space Shuttle, which is you know, for example, a few million lines of code, all the way to Vista, and this gets like 50 to 60 million lines of code, right? And with that comes more bugs, and in some ways that makes you more unhappy, and so they have to go back and refactor things, and in general, just to fundamentally rethink how they organize these OSs, which is why it takes any of these companies a few years to actually go from one OS version to another, because a lot changes within their subsystems. One example I would like to give of all the different places in which an operating system is used and where it fundamentally has impact on how the system itself is used is using this Mars rover program, right? And I'll show you uh, what are the different challenges that come up when you have software running on a completely different planet where there are no humans, 
and you're interacting with all you're interacting with is just a machine which has a whole bunch of sensors on it, right? And something goes wrong, there's a whole bunch of problems. But just think about what the challenges are, right? So the Pathfinder was this uh, robot thing that ran on Mars, taking pictures, you know, taking samples, things like that. It had a 20 megahertz processor back then, right? It had 128 megs of RAM, and it had a whole bunch of scientific instruments on it, all these I/O devices, right? And it was charging itself using solar panels. Right? Now you think about a software that is running with that limited amount of resource while other I.O. devices themselves are also containing with the software itself for the resource. Right? For example, think about the image processing algorithms that are running for the cameras. Right? Now they are containing with the operating system itself. So think about how thin the operating system has to be so that within 128 megs of RAM it can let all these other applications run while it still manages the resource as best as it can. So you can't hit a reset button. So what happens if your thing starts hanging, right? So it must be able to reboot itself. So they had to build um, services in the OS itself that were bulletproof, that if something bad happened, they would always kick in and make sure the rest of the system could cure itself. So they had to have self-healing process built in. Right? So how do you build software that does that? And then there are things like individual programs must not interfere with each other, for example, what happens if your um, some camera, some photo software essentially crashed the uh, GPS positioning software? Now you've lost complete contact with your robot system, right? And all it did was you missed out on a few photos, big deal, right? And so you've got to make sure certain subsystems are prioritized and always kept up and running because they are fundamental to the working of the system itself, while other subsystems which are not so high up in priority can be allowed to crash and recover. And finally, even if you do all this, software may just crash periodically, right? So nothing is bulletproof, and it's just we all deal with this every day in our lives, and no software can keep running forever. There's going to be some point where it, at which it crashes. In such cases, the OS has the task of automatically restarting these programs, right? And then it has to send the diagnostic, the logging, and all of that back to Earth in this case, right? And so. How do you restart these programs? How do you checkpoint them? How do you make sure that they are restartable? Right? How do you make sure they are working correctly? How do you diagnose any faults that may happen? This all is a job of the OS. And even in your desktop OS or any of these things like iPad, you don't want one application interfering with the other. For example, you have the email service or you have your phone book. You don't want that being scavenged by some app that you just downloaded from the uh, store. Right? So how do you do that? How do you set up the protection policies? These are all questions that come up. Go ahead, Evgeny. Is there any difference between mobile operating systems and desktop operating systems? Over the years, fundamentally, the two were very different, and they had entirely different groups, uh, which built them. One reason was because there were not enough resources available on phones, so they couldn't do a lot of the things that they could can do today. So fundamentally, if you look at the old Palm systems, or even systems before that, they would build what's known as an embedded OS, where essentially are running, like in this case, with the 20 megahertz, 120 megs of RAM, they were all limited resources. So they were really focused on just the task of, here's a bunch of applications from this one specific vendor. So HP would put out the OS, and it would put out the applications that ran on the OS. So there was a tight coupling between the user programs and the OS itself. With the advent of smartphones and other things, essentially, fundamentally, that uh, boundary has been introduced and you have this notion that the, there are programs that the vendor has not necessarily written that also run on the device and they may not be vetted to the same extent. Now you have the same issue that a desktop system has which is untrustworthy software, um, they could they state that they share, how do you manage resources, how do you protect one against the other and there are all these desktop uh, notions that are also introduced into the system. Along with the fact that the OS has to be as thin as possible, just because you, you don't want the OS to contend with the application themselves for the resource, which in this case is the battery. So they have to focus on that aspect as well. So over the years, what, run, what is running on the phone as an OS has changed over time. Right? And today I would say they're more worried about security. Right? For example, Microsoft's latest OS, Windows 8, and the versions after that are actually looking at allowing multi-user OSs. For example, in your iPad, you don't have a concept of multiple users. 
right? Microsoft actually wants that concept also introduced, right? Which is traditionally a desktop concept, but they want to think about your mobile device being accessed by multiple people at the same time. So the question is, fundamental question is how do you tame complexity, right? Because that's the, if you have a lot of different kinds of hardware, uh, different CPUs, different disks, different types of devices, different networking environments, how do you make sure that your user program doesn't have to deal with all this, right? There are all kinds of other questions, right? Um, the programmer may, to, may need to write a single program that performs many activities. He may want to print on the screen, write to the disk all at the same time, right? Uh, the program may need to be modded for different kinds of hardware, right? For prov what if the thing starts crashing? Like the faulty program uh, crashes everything, right? You got to think about that, right? And what if programs have access to all hardware, right? What if one program just took control of the screen and then, you know, locked it down? No other program could access that, right? These are all questions that the OS has to handle and manage, right? And that's its, that's the, that's its main job. In some ways, you can think of this as a virtual machine abstraction, right? A lot of you may have heard of this terminology called virtual machines. Uh, in this case, I'm actually going to try to explain to you what the OS does and what does a virtual machine actually mean. So what's going to happen is your program, your system itself is split into three, right? So you've got the application layer, you've got the operating system layer, and then you've got the hardware layer, okay? And if your application directly ran on the hardware, then there's a problem. Right? Because then the application is completely exposed to if the hardware changes, for example, the number of cores. Right? It has to deal with that. But then what the operating system does really is that it deals with the hardware. Right? So the people who write the operating system sit together with Intel or whatever, it's Intel publishes its manuals. They go pour through those documents and then figure out how to interact with the hardware itself. And then they have another layer that essentially exposes a fixed interface to the application itself. And this does not change as often, right? So your hardware keeps changing. The operating systems person has to go through the effort of porting the operating system to the new hardware. But then the application doesn't need to worry about that because then it just uses the abstraction that the OS does and then doesn't need to worry about, you know, how the hardware actually works. For example, you use printf in your program, right? It doesn't care about how big the display is or what display it actually is, right? It doesn't matter if it's an LCD or a CRT, right? It just seems to work somehow. So the question is, how does it just seem to work, right, even though you're talking about different pieces of hardware? And that's because the operating system deals with this, right? And in some ways, it optimizes for convenience and utilization. It manages all of this and security as well, right? So for any OS um, resource that it manages, for example, like if it's scheduling multiple people on a processor or whether it's managing the memory system or, for example, even your network interface, right, when multiple people want it. The real question that it, the OS needs to answer is, what's the hardware interface, right? What does the hardware look like? Because this is where device drivers come in, right? You plug in a new camera, you may need to install a new device driver to interact with it. But then when the camera is exported to your system, it just looks like a normal folder in which all your photos are the same. How do these different cameras with different pieces of hardware actually export the same interface, right? So that's an important thing. And the other thing is what the application interface. That is, how does my, how do these different hardware devices, for example, you have 100 different cameras, 100 different flash USB sticks. How do they all look to the program? You want them all to look the same. You want a common abstraction. It's respect of what the hardware actually is underneath, right? And this is the other aspect that the OS has to answer in some way. So if you look at, uh, what a virtual machine is. So essentially, it's a software emulation of an abstract system. So your programs are built for these abstract system, and they run on top of something that they don't know what exactly is, but then the operating system takes care of mapping these systems, right? Uh, it may look like hardware, and it depends on what features you want. And the program varies from one hardware and OS to another one, right? Different piece of hardware, the OS would do something slightly different. And what this buys you is essentially program simplicity. So each process just thinks that it's got all the memory and CPU all the time, when in reality there are multiple of them running at the same time, and the OS is um, multiplexing them. Um, different devices appear to have the same interface, like we just spoke about. Uh, some device interfaces are more powerful than even raw hardware, right? So if you've got a bitmap display where you think you've got an infinite collection of bits, you've got a large screen of bits, those are distilled down to specific resolution on the screen, 
we have a smaller screen, they, they scale down. All of this is done by the OS itself, right? So if you got Ethernet card versus networking, so there are different uh, notions of this, right? And finally, there's fault isolation, right? And so with fault isolation, programs do not impact other processes. That's the fundamental notion, that if you have two separate programs, one program should not directly impact the results of the thing of another, right? For example, what happens previously, if you think about it, one good example is if you had things like Firefox, Chrome, when one tab crashed, the whole program crashed, right? But offload, if you've noticed, one when a single tab crashes, it's only that tab that crashes. The other windows in the browser themselves are still okay. This is because the browser is actually using operating system concepts to isolate the individual tabs. And so if you have one tab crashes, you can just kill that, and the other ones are still continuing to run. Right? So a bug does not crash the rest of the system of the whole machine. So this is an example of um, how a system would possibly virtualize. So you fundamentally have got the hardware first, so if, on which the operating system is running. So these are running in concert. So if you have specific hardware, you've got to build the OS to target that. And then you've got a layer of application possibly that's running directly on top of the OS. But you could also introduce an extra layer of virtualization. Right, that exposes an interface similar to the hardware and run an OS on top of that. So if you look at this, in this case, you have a guest operating system that's running directly on top of another operating system. And then there's a program that runs on top of that. Right? And all of these are made feasible because of this whole notion of virtual machine interface, where the software is essentially playing the trick and it's introducing an interface that looks very similar to hardware so that you can actually run other software that was targeting that hardware on top of a software interface, really. So this goes back again from what is an OS to what does an OS do, right? So if you look, think about what an OS does, one uh, possible explanation from the Dragon Book that you all that's prescribed text for this class is an OS is similar to a government, right? So but then the question is, what does a government do? It does, does anything useful by itself, right? The first thing is coordinates and manages, right? Manages all resources. Prevents, prevents errors and improper use of the computer itself or the hardware, right? The next thing it does is it facilitates, right? So it, it builds useful abstractions. It provides facilities and services. Like, for example, standard libraries, right? You want to print something on the screen, it provides you a function that actually does that. You don't have to worry about how the thing actually goes out onto the screen, right? And finally, it makes application programs easier, faster, less prone because your program doesn't have to deal with these aspects. Now, you want to write something through disk, it provides an interface to do that. You're not really worried about, is it a disk underneath? Is it implemented as flash? What is the actual technology? You don't really care because the OS takes upon itself the responsibility to do that, right? And some features reflect both tasks, right? For example, file system is needed by everyone, and so it kind of facilitates, but the file system also needs to be protected, right? You don't want someone accessing, you know, someone else's file, right? And so it does both the job of facilitating and it does the job of protection. Right? So it does both at the same time. So if that's a very abstract notion. Right? What I just described is you can build lots of different software that does, does these things, right? but they're not all operating systems. So if you think about what is really an operating system, you want to put, put your finger on a piece of software and say this is an operating system, then the most likely answer is that it does memory management, which manages DRAM and how the things move between the disks or the I.O. devices and memory itself. It does I.O. management, manage I.O. devices itself. It manages CPUs because your programs don't care about how many CPUs they are, just, they just got to run different in the processes, then you got to multiplex them. And then you've got synchronization and mutual exclusion where you've got different threads and processes interacting, so you got to kind of manage them. And so it does that. It does uh, communications. You know, one question is, does email belong in an OS, right? In the past, some systems did have that, right? Today, not. So it keeps changing, but if you want to contact another computer in your system, it's going to have to go through the operating system, right? And so if you want to go to the network, you have to involve the OS. And so there are questions about that. Uh, then there's multitasking, multiprogramming. And then there are other questions such as what about file system, multimedia support, right? And then user interface, you know, what about the browser, right? So you've got Google's Chrome OS where they believe that the browser is the OS. Every uh, thing that you run, runs on top of an OS, on inside the browser. So then your browser becomes the gateway to everything else that you interact with in the system, right? You've got Ajax application, Google Docs is a great example, right? So you run, 
um, an application an editor on top of a browser, right? And so that gets really interesting as well, right? In general, the idea behind all these slides is that there is no universally accepted definition, right? For uh, you, it, the, the real idea of an operating system is very nebulous. Right? You can't really point your finger and say it does this or does that, right? And what different vendors call operating systems varies differently. Like if I got Google calls its own Chrome browser possibly an operating system, but you know Apple or Windows won't do that, right? And but the fundamental idea is that if you think about an operating system scandal, it's the one program that's always running on your computer. Other programs may crash, other programs may be killed, they may not or may be running, but the OS is the one, the operating system kernel itself is the one program that's just always running on your system, always actually being the starting point at which other programs actually start to live and start running, right? Everything else in your program is, you know, shipped or it could exist or not, but not your OS. OS always exists. Right? So, to summarize, if you think about what an OS is, it provides a useful virtual machine abstraction to handle diverse hardware. It coordinates resources and protects users from each other. And it simplifies application development by providing standard services and abstractions. So for example, you want to just print without caring about what the screen size is. Right? And these, along with fault containment and fault tolerance and fault recovery, which is essentially saying that if a process fails or an application fails, you want to be able to recover and not affect other processes are all the actions that an OS has to take. And with that in mind, we'll actually go forward looking at each of these in detail.